for many different types of surgeries, anesthesiologists place a breathing tube into a patient's windpipe. This is almost always done after a patient has gone under general anesthesia and is completely unconscious. But in rare cases, we actually intubate patients while they're still completely awake. My name's Max Feinstein, and I'm an anesthesiologist filming here at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. In this video, I explain why awake intubations might occur and go through how they're done step by step. This video does not contain medical advice, but it does contain footage of a person being intubated, not me. Before we get too far, I want to highlight each important part of the procedure from start to finish. Well, I'm not going to highlight it, but this gentleman featured in a YouTube video that I've linked right here named Dr. Ian is actually going to intubate himself, and I'll talk through the highlights of what exactly he's doing. The first thing that you'll see happen is that someone's actually going to put a very small needle into the patient's windpipe and spray lidocaine, which is a numbing medication that will coat his vocal cords and a large part of his windpipe. That's a nice friend. Coughing's good, helps us spread it up and get the bottom of the cords. The next thing you'll see in this video is that he's going to gargle a different form of lidocaine, which again is just going to help numb the area that's going to be affected in the procedure. What he's about to gargle is called viscous lidocaine, and usually we measure out a specific amount, but here we go. And in doing this, he's numbing up the back of his mouth. And now he is applying some lidocaine to a piece of gauze that's attached to a stick that he's going to put in the back of his mouth to just really make sure that the back of the mouth is as numb as possible before he gets started. So now he's going to get started intubating himself. Ordinarily, anesthesiologists are intubating a patient, so it takes some extra skill to do this. You can see on the screen back here that he is expertly navigating the anatomy that he needs to find finding the way to the vocal cords, and he's actually already into the windpipe, which is called the trachea. What you're looking at on the screen are the tracheal rings. Now he's actually got the scope all the way down to where the windpipe splits off into both lungs. These are called the main stem bronchi. He's happy with where he is. So he's sliding off the endotracheal tube, or the breathing tube, that's already loaded up onto the fiber optic scope. He'll advance this tube far enough that he can actually see the tip of the tube as it reaches where the lungs split off. Now he takes out the scope, and he is breathing through this tube. And a testament to how well he applied the lidocaine, he actually appears pretty comfortable. Nice. Well, hopefully that was uh, educational for you guys um, and maybe a little bit entertaining. Um, you know, if, if you guys are interested, um, then uh, put it in the comments. Uh, um, I'm more than happy to do another video that kind of goes through some of the other. Don't mind if I just uh, drop a like and I'll add a comment. Thanks, Dr. Ian. The reason why an awake intubation would be undertaken to begin with is any circumstance where it would be extremely dangerous to have a patient be anesthetized and potentially lose their ability to breathe on their own before we had an endotracheal tube in place. You see, ordinarily, if a patient is going to receive general anesthesia and have a breathing tube placed, then that's the order that it typically occurs, meaning Anesthesia is first administered so that a patient is unconscious and does not have to go through the experience of having a breathing tube placed. There are a number of different methods for placing breathing tubes, and the one that's most often used, which is called laryngoscopy, typically is very stimulating, meaning that if someone were awake, it would actually be really painful. This is because intubating someone with a typical laryngoscope like this one entails usually picking up their entire head with this tiny little portion of a metal blade, just like this. But when a patient receives general anesthesia, or even a lighter level of anesthesia like deep sedation or moderate sedation, that can actually take away their ability to breathe on their own. Now, dealing with a patient who's not breathing is a typical part of the anesthesiologist's day. 
And in fact, we often administer medications called paralytics that cause patients to stop breathing intentionally. Paralytics are administered sometimes for surgical purposes so that patients are really still, but almost counterintuitively, paralytics can actually be really helpful for optimizing intubation conditions. All of this to say that while it's normally not a problem if a patient isn't breathing, because anesthesiologists are trained with lots of tools to deal with that, if a patient has what we would call a difficult airway, meaning some sort of problem that would interfere with their ability to breathe, or interfere with our ability to help them breathe, then we've potentially got a real problem on our hands. Examples of conditions that may be associated with a difficult airway include a patient who's gotten radiation to their head or neck, which can change the anatomy of the neck and then make intubation more difficult. Another example of a factor that can lead to a difficult airway is a tumor that's in the airway itself. Airway tumors are relatively uncommon, and sometimes anesthesiologists know about them, and in fact the tumor may be the reason for the surgery, but on rare occasion, a patient may have an airway tumor that's not known until we try to place a breathing tube and see that there's a tumor in the way. After having intubated about 2,000 people, I've actually had the experience once of trying to place a breathing tube and seeing that there was a big tumor that was in the way. I was able to get the breathing tube past the tumor, and then I went ahead and took a picture of the tumor to give to the patient so they could make an appointment with an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Another big red flag for anesthesiologists to think about a difficult airway is if a patient comes in and says, I've had anesthesia before, and when I woke up, they told me that it was very difficult to intubate me. If I hear a patient say that, then I'm going to assume that they have a difficult airway until proven otherwise. That's part of the reason that it's really important for anesthesiologists to ask a very detailed history of their patients and also look through their medical records prior to anesthetizing them. While just the thought of being intubated awake sounds like it would be very uncomfortable, as you saw in that video, it's actually possible to make it a pretty comfortable experience for patients. The first step to doing that is setting expectations for patients and letting them know what the experience is going to be like, and also getting their input as to how they might want that experience to be. For example, do they want their eyes covered so that they don't see anything, or would they prefer to have their eyes open so they have a sense of what's going on? And just generally speaking, talking through every step of what's going on can usually be reassuring for patients, although sometimes patients just don't want to hear anything at all, which is fine too. One of the most important strategies that we have available to make awake intubations more comfortable is lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic that comes in a number of different formulations that can be administered to patients in a number of different ways. There's no single best way to administer lidocaine. It's really just a function of what is the anesthesiologist most skilled at doing so that they can help the patient feel comfortable. As you saw in this video, it's possible to spray the windpipe itself with lidocaine that's administered through a needle through the front of the neck. This is called a transtracheal block. On top of that, there are even more blocks that can be administered inside the patient's mouth to get the very back of the throat covered. Besides blocks, there are a number of strategies that don't involve a needle. One of those is simply nebulizing lidocaine to have a patient breathe it in, and as they breathe it in, it coats the back of the tongue, the back of the mouth, and then the windpipe itself. There are also a number of devices available to spray lidocaine in the back of the mouth. One of those is a mucosal atomization device, or an MAD, which allows us to spray lidocaine using a syringe. Or if you want to be even more aggressive about it, you can use this powered atomization device, which is kind of like a small garden hose that allows us to spray lidocaine in the back of the mouth. Or you can have patients gargle lidocaine like you saw in the video, or you can pour lidocaine down an oral airway and have it drip onto the back of the tongue. Basically, the only limit to how you can apply lidocaine to your patient is your creativity and also making sure that you don't get into the toxic range of lidocaine, which can produce a condition called LAST, or local anesthesia systemic toxicity. Some of the mild symptoms of LAST include ringing in the ears or tinnitus or numbness around the mouth. But the most serious complications of LAST include seizures and cardiovascular collapse. LAST can be avoided by making sure that you stay within the safe cumulative dosing range of all of the lidocaine that you've administered, and if it does occur, there's a treatment option for it called intralipid, but this is one of those situations where an ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure. Finally, anesthesiologists can consider offering some sedation to patients to help them feel more comfortable. 
Typically, that would be a medication like midazolam or a very fast-acting opioid like remifentanil. But keep in mind that any amount of sedation has the potential to cause a patient to stop breathing well, which is the whole issue that we're trying to circumvent to begin with. A general rule of thumb that I like to use for sedation for awake intubations is that any agent that I administer should have a reversal agent. So midazolam can be reversed by flumazenil, and remifentanil can be reversed by naloxone or just a short period of time because it wears off very fast. But propofol, for example, does not have a reversal agent and is therefore not a medication I typically use to help a patient feel relaxed during an awake intubation. Between setting patient expectations, a generous amount of lidocaine, plus or minus some sedation, it's definitely possible to help a patient feel very comfortable during an awake intubation. In fact, I once had a patient give me a thumbs up when we got the breathing tube right where it needed to be as I pushed the propofol to have them go off to sleep. Before you get started, you of course need to put an endotracheal tube on the scope itself, which is very easily done by sliding it in and it's most helpful to secure the tube up top so it doesn't slip down and get in your way as you're trying to intubate. So I usually do that with a small piece of tape. Just make sure this tape is very easy to remove so that you don't get hung up trying to rip this off while the patient's still awake and you're trying to get the tube down the scope. A couple of technical considerations before. Well, this is unfortunate. It appears my cameraman walked off the job and left the camera on slow motion while it was recording and doesn't seem to recover the sound when I run it back at full speed. But basically all that I was trying to say here was that it could be helpful to administer a medication called glycopyrrolate to patients, which can cause their mouth to dry out, making it easier to use the fiber optic scope so that you don't get any secretions on the camera. The other point that I wanted to convey here, which it's actually kind of convenient that it's in slow motion, is that it's important to have tension on the scope itself, and you do that by holding your arms out straight. If you have tension, then it's very easy to translate rotational motion from your top hand to your bottom hand, whereas if your hands are bunched up like this and you try and rotate with your top hand, that rotation really doesn't get translated down to the bottom of the scope, so it just makes it a lot harder to navigate going clockwise and counterclockwise. You can really see the struggle on my face in slow motion here. Ouch. As I'm first getting started, I actually watch the tip of the scope go into the back of the patient's mouth until I can no longer see it. At that point, I take a look at the screen and try to navigate very gently to stay off of any structures that could cause the patient to cough. I'm looking for the vocal cords and this is the perfect view so I'll go ahead and try to pass the tip of the scope through the vocal cords without actually touching them or any surrounding structures. Now that I'm past the vocal cords and I'm inside the trachea, I try and stay off the walls of the trachea and make my way down the middle until I can see the bifurcation of the right and left main stem bronchi. This is the carina. This is the exact spot where I want to be, so I'll go ahead and untape my endotracheal tube slide it gently into the patient's mouth while keeping this view on my screen. With the carina in view, I slide the endotracheal tube down the tip of the scope until I can see both the tip of the tube and the carina, assuring me that I'm in exactly the right position, at which point I can go ahead and remove my fiber optic scope and connect the patient to the ventilator. Now that I've got the endotracheal tube in place, I'll administer anesthesia so that we can get started with the surgery. As with many aspects of medicine, practicing fiber optic technique is the way to perfect it. But of course, practicing on an awake patient is not typically a very kind thing to do. So looking for alternative options can be really helpful for you and also for your patients. If you have access to a simulation mannequin, that can be a really great strategy for getting comfortable with the scope. There are also simulators that turn a fiber optic scope into a video game. There's one that is bopping gophers in holes and I mean, I'm from Missouri. I never bopped gophers in holes. I don't know, starting out with the gopher game is definitely better than starting out on an awake person. And of course, it's really important to read about all of the key anatomy and physiology before you get started. 
One of the resources I'd recommend is from Nysora, and I put a link right here that you can check out for more information. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video I made where I demonstrate how to intubate a patient using a straight blade like this one. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.